The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, ready to go on lecture five, I guess this is. Um, so this, we've done the uh, one-way wave equation. Uh, first order equation, and now it's just natural to see what about the ordinary second order wave equation. And uh, on this board, I've written it two ways. I've written it as a second order equation, so second time derivative appears. That's going to make a change. We're going to have uh, if we'll have second differences in time. So we're, we're going to have more steps. And uh, of the same second difference, a matching second difference in space. And so that's one way. Then this is another important way to write the same equation as a first order system. So I can get back to first order systems and I can use all those methods, uh, Friedrich, Lax Friedrichs, for example, Lax Wendroff, whatever improvements we think of uh, on this first order system. d by dt of a vector is a matrix times d by dx of the vector. So that's a, you really have a choice here. And written this way, well, notice a little bit of. Uh, Good thing, good, one good thing here, the matrix that shows up is symmetric. That was by the careful choice of putting a C in there. Then do you see that the first equation in this system is UTT is C times C UXX. So the first equation is the wave equation. And what about the second equation? This is typical when you reduce things to a to a lower order system, that you get an equation here which is just an identity. The derivative of C, the time, this is C U X T, it's the, the, the derivative in X and T from there. And we have C times the X derivative of U T, the cross derivative. So that is an identity because U T X is the same as U X T. We can take time and x and t derivatives in either order for, for a function of x and t. So we'll see that. I guess what I want to do in the lecture is not to repeat Lax Friedrichs or Lax Wendroff for this system. That would be unexciting. Let me just mention what are the eigenvalues of that matrix? So the eigenvalue in the, in a, for a system, it's the eigenvalues of the matrix that tell us what waves we've got, what speeds they go, where it, when it was one by one, of course, it was just that single number C. But what are the eigenvalues of that matrix? Now, having made it a symmetric matrix, uh, we know right away it has real eigenvalues. And so it's a wave problem. For a heat equation, we would, we would see something different. But this will be a wave equation, and the, this has two eigenvalues, and they are C and minus C. Just you could quickly check that that two by two matrix has eigenvalues C and minus C. They add up to zero, which is the trace. They multiply, C times minus C is minus C squared which is the determinant, so that's, they're the right eigenvalues. So that's going to tell us what we'll find every way, that the speeds of the waves are C and minus C, which means a wave going one way with speed C and a wave going the other way with speed C. That's, so, so it's a two-way wave equation. And this is the equation of real uh, that really happens, and I wanted to say just a little bit about, just two words about real problems, because 
we can't in these first days tackle the difficult problems of electromagnetism, antenna decay, design, uh, um, all kinds of uh, wave problems. I, I guess I'm hoping some of you may be meeting real wave problems in other courses and would uh, make a project that, that uh, tries our methods on real problems. I, I, I just wanted to write down here uh, one sort of typical real problem. So in a real problem, we, we have a, a variable coefficient x because maybe our material is not homogeneous, it's not uniform. And we have a forcing term. I just put F for the amplitude to emphasize that's forcing term, so F standing for forcing. But it's an oscillating forcing term. It's a it, this is what you're going to have. And in electromagnetism, the frequency is going to be very, very high. And then, uh, so this is a problem that you, that's not easy numerically. Very, very high frequencies would normally require very, very small wavelengths, very, very small delta x, because you, you remember there would be a k delta x in the error. So if we took a big delta x and, or even an ordinary size delta x and let the frequency go way, way up, high, high frequency oscillation, our k delta x would be big and the accuracy would be poor and, and the results useless. So uh, a lot of, I'm really, guess I'm thinking here about a course on wave propagation would study this as a first model problem get some, do some analysis, and then uh, go into 2D and 3D. That's, uh, that's the reality of, of, of wave theory, is you get, you can get asymptotic results for K going to infinity. You get thing, things, uh, you, you're looking in, in matching powers of K, so to speak, and you're getting plane waves and, and uh, interesting stuff. That, that's, we can't do already right away here. So I, I'm going back to the ordinary wave equation, either second, start with second order. UTT is C squared UXX. Okay, that's our goal. And as I said, we don't want to see Lax Friedrichs and Lax Wendorf again. We know those. It's uh, rather, one, so one new method is going to show up. One, and it's uh, leapfrog is the right name, the natural name to give it. Leapfrog because, well, in the time direction, we have time n minus 1, n, and n plus 1. There's a leap there. But let me start with semi-discrete. We haven't done this until today. Semi-discrete means, as you see, that the time variable stays continuous. We have ordinary differential equations in T. But the space variable is what's getting discrete. So the problem is like half discrete. Discrete in X, but not, there's a delta X, but there's no delta T yet. So, so it's natural to like analyze this problem and what, so what do we have, really? We have, in the x direction, we have a mesh of width delta x. So we have unknowns, that if that's zero, j is measuring. So j delta, j delta x is the, is the typical point, point number j along there. And then in the time direction, we're going continuously. So I don't have discrete steps. So it's called, because those are lines in the time direction, this is semi-discrete is also referred to as the method of lines. So the method of lines is this, is what we're doing here. And it's, all I want to do is, what I always do, take exponentials, look at their growth factors, 
understand the equation. Well, actually, I better do it first with the wave equation itself. So, so I guess my, my organization for today is first step is follow e to the i k x for the wave equation. So I'll do that here. U T T equals C squared U X X. And I'm going to look at U proportional to, and I'll call this factor G again, G of T, and times the frequency I K X. So I'm going to look for pure exponential. Okay. And we'll quickly find them. And then I'm going to do the same for semi-discrete, where that x becomes j delta x. And I'm at point j. And then I'm going to eventually look at the discrete, now fully discrete, discrete in time and discrete in space. And uh, the question of stability arises. Accuracy, we can you pretty much we pretty much know the accuracy for second differences. The that's a second order accurate thing because it's centered, but stability is going to come in. Okay. So that's this is our first step. And and, and then I'll just mention what other point remains in this in this uh, wave equation, is to look at the uh, first order system. How does that look in uh, space and time? Well, as I said, the obvious thing to do would be Lax Friedrichs or Lax Wendroff, but there's another idea. And it brings in uh, a staggered grid. Uh, well, you'll see it. it uh, somehow that staggered grid is really an important idea that we haven't met yet. That some unknowns are on the standard grid, UJN, but the other unknowns are on uh, uh, a grid that's, that's half a delta X and half a delta T different. And it's just right, actually. So that's the that's a premier method in electromagnetism. So that's that's what's coming. But let's start with the second order method because we haven't seen second order methods before. Okay, second order equation. Plug in G. Okay, so I have the second time derivative gives me G double prime times e to the i k x. See, I'm separating variables, of course, t here and x there. And on the other side, I have c squared. Now I have the x variable, so that brings down an i k. So that's i k squared times g e to the i k x. Good. So simple, but but uh, substituting this is uh, just the, a natural first step to see what's happening. And then, of course, canceling e to the i k x leaves us with the equation for the g. g double prime is, I'll make that i squared minus, minus c squared k squared g. And, of course, the new aspect is it's second order. So it's got two solutions instead of just one. It's constant coefficients, of course. And so we look for exponentials. And the solution then would be two solutions are uh, some, there's an e to the i, I guess I'm bringing back the i, e to the i c k t, e to the i k x, and e to the minus i c k t e to the i k x. So those are the two possible g's. Those are the, uh, those are if we take their second time derivative, 
we get uh, the same as taking the second x derivative there. Well, we get the factor c is in the right place. You, you see it. The second time derivative brings this factor down just as we wanted. But the point is that there are two of them. There's a, so this, this I can write as e to the i k x minus c, x plus c t. That's our old friend. And this one I can write as e to the i k x minus c t, which is our new friend, the new way the wave that's going to the right. So this is a, this x plus ct is, it follows the characteristic lines to the left, just the, just the way we had in the one-way wave equation. This x minus ct a const, stays constant on characteristic lines going up to the right. It, it travels with speed c and uh, the signal travels along those characteristics with speed c, so that a, a, an, initial, an initial value now, maybe I draw, draw a picture over here. So here's t equals, this is x as always, this is t equals zero. I have some initial value u at zero, zero, and I also have an initial velocity, because I'm in got a second order equation, but information somehow, pure exponential information travels along characteristics this way, that's the new one, and characteristics this way, that's the old one. This is, this is time space. I'm not graph, I'm graphing the two characteristic lines now. X minus CT equals well, if it starts from zero, then it would be zero. And this is the x plus ct equals zero, the one we had before, the two characteristic lines. OK. Waves are going both ways. Right. And now, what we were able to do with the first order equation, we even got a, a, a completely explicit solution to the, to the one-way wave equation, and we can do the same for the two-way wave equation. So I better write it down. I better write down the solution. So, so let me just continue this same idea. The general, the complete solution will be u of x and t is some function of x minus ct and some function of, call it f2, of x plus ct. Oh, now I'm taking the jump. The jump from one exponential, a particular k, that gave me these particular guys to all exponentials and assembling all exponentials into functions. Well, so why is that okay? It's only okay in this because of this very special situation that all frequencies are behaving the same here. All frequencies I have no dispersion. Dispersion is, is going to be different behavior of different frequencies. So that's an important fact which we don't face here. There will be dispersion in the discrete methods, the semi-discrete and the discrete methods. Different frequencies will travel at different speeds, and that's what produces the oscillating error, whatever shape the error has, is because different k's are doing slightly different things, as we'll see when we do the discrete ones. But in the continuous case, every k we have the same uh, traveling either with speed c or minus c, and therefore we put them all together and we have a whole function traveling with speed c or minus c. And now we've got two functions, and we have to, we have to match two initial conditions. We have to match we have to uh, we have to match a u of x and zero, 
and the time derivative has to match a ut of x and 0. So these are the initial conditions. And uh, you just match them up and you find the answer. So you discover what these functions really are. And it turns out that I think we had, you remember before we had a u of x plus c, t, and 0. That was our, that was everything in the solution to the one-way wave equation. Now we will have uh, u of x minus c, t, 0, and this divided by 2. So there you see a wave going each way. And the division by 2 makes us, ma now we're matching the initial condition. So that would be the total answer if the equation, if, this, if the body starts from rest with zero velocity. But I haven't matched, so I've only matched du dt equals zero. I think the time derivative of that would be zero. Yeah, because the time derivative, this would bring out a c, this would bring out a minus c, and at t equals zero, they'd cancel. So I need uh, another term, and it turns out to be, I'll just write it down, it's got to depend on x minus ct and x plus ct, and it's this, it's the integral of this velocity dx. I won't, there's no reason to take time to derive that. I think it's right and good check. So uh, what this means is that the initial velocity is, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's entering somehow all along. Somehow the initial velocity is, is affecting uh, things within, within this cone, this characteristic cone of, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, defined by the characteristic line. And in two dimensions, that cone will really look like a cone. It'll look like an ice cream cone. Or maybe that's in three dimensions. Yeah, whatever. Uh, in other words, uh, if the initial condition was a delta function at the origin, you could quickly see what the solution would be. And if the delta, if the initial condition was a step function at the origin, what would happen then? Suppose I start with a step function at the origin, so like a wall of water, and suppose it's at rest. So at nothing, it, it's at, at moment t equals zero, I remove the dam, and the water starts, the water flows. Then this term is zero because there was no initial velocity. And this term is just half of that wall goes one way and half goes the other way. And the, the notes draw a picture of that solution. Yeah, so that's OK. I've kind of quickly disposed of the, the solution of the wave equation. And of course, you know, that, that's too easy. This is, uh, uh, I mean, that's good to know and good to compare when we meet real problems where C depends on X, where there's a forcing term, where there's, where there's real complications. Okay. And, but it's, it's, it just pays to stay with the model problems for the, at the beginning. So I'm, I'm going to stay with the model problem and move on to um, discrete. So, so try to understand, let, let me try to understand what happens if I make the space variable discrete. Right. Yeah, this is a, 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 a oh, I, I guess I should say another step toward reality would be have some boundaries. 
I, uh, here, this is on the whole line, x from minus infinity to infinity. So reality would be that there would be, this picture would have some boundary, maybe there, at say minus l and l, and some boundary conditions there, and uh, on that boundary, and th that, so now we have a finite problem. So it means the calculations are fine, but it means some new effects are coming in. Waves can bounce back off the boundary, partly. They can go out, be, be lost, go beyond, go beyond or, or, or disappear, depending what the boundary conditions are. So that's another part of reality is boundary conditions. I, I, I'm probably suggesting then some uh, uh, more realistic numerical experiment. So a realistic numerical experiment would be put in some boundaries, make this a finite system. So, so if that's zero, let's, let's just have a finite number and stop there. This, is, this would be one boundary, this would be the other. Then I have just like seven unknowns in that problem. That would be a seven by seven matrix over there. And it would be the second difference matrix that uh, was so fundamental in, uh, is so fundamental in uh, all of uh, scientific computing. So we have here a second difference matrix, but it's infinite because because I haven't got a boundary right now. So that, the, the fact of not having a boundary means Fourier is ready to go. So I'm going to plug in. I'm going to, again, I'm going to try U. This is capital U now because I've discretized something. And, uh, oh, I better write this in a, in a form where we see the J. So can I write this equation? just again for u number j. So tracking up this line, for example, or this one. So I'm tracking up this line. Do you see that u is now a system? In this case, uh, let's see, I shouldn't have put this one in so that I'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's good. Yeah. So. So my unknowns are u, j, tracking up that line. Each u, j is, is, is going in, in the time direction. So, my, my, so this equation is really uh, the time derivative. It's an ordinary derivative. I can write d and not partial derivative because the only derivatives here are in time of u, j is c squared over delta x squared times uj plus 1 minus 2uj mi plus uj minus 1. That's my equation. My system of equations. Sorry. My system of equations. And for the moment, I'm thinking j goes from minus infinity to infinity. I'm not going to put in a boundary. Okay, but what I will do, of course, is try uj is some, is some growth factor that, j is a space, is counting space steps. So the growth factor is in time, and it's continuous in time, because time is continuous, but it's, it's, always e to the i k j delta x. Right? That's the right thing to plug in. I mean, I, I guess what we're, what I'm really, uh, the reason for really doing this is just to reinforce the idea that trying a pure exponential is a good thing to do. It's even a good thing to do with variable coefficients and, and, and real problems. 
and it's absolutely a good thing to do with these model problems. Okay, plug it in, and what happens? Okay, so the so I get g double prime times the exponential, but of course you know in advance I'm going to cancel that exponential, is c squared over delta x squared times what goes there? What what will cancel the exponential? So so I'm I'm imagining that exponential is far out, but here it is at j plus one. So I've I I've incremented j by one, so that is going to give me an e to the i k delta x, right? Here I haven't incremented it, and here I've incremented it by minus one. So that will give me an e to the minus i k delta x. All times this same exponential which appeared there and appeared there and got canceled. So that, that's it there. G double prime. Oh, there's got to be a G. Right, there's a G here. Right. Right. When I plugged in on the right hand side, I got a G that was so uninteresting I lost it. Okay. What does. What's G? I guess the main point to see is this quantity, which is divided by delta x squared, which is coming because we have differences instead of derivatives. When we had derivatives, that quantity was c squared i k squared. Or in other words, minus c squared k squared. That, that, this, was, this was the, the correct uh, factor, and this one is the discrete factor. And, and it's worth just paying a moment of attention to, the, to compare the two. To compare the two. Okay. Where am I going to write that comparison? I guess it's going to be on the board that's hidden. So I'm going to, can you try to remember that? Let me, let me focus just on this quantity for the minute, or even just on this one, just because we see it so many times, because it's coming directly from second differences. Uh, uh, for the moment, let me take k delta x. I'll just call it theta. It's some angle. So can I just do a little bit of trig? with this factor 2 minus 2 cos theta. Let's see. I'm going to I'm going to bring out a minus sign. So I'm going to I'm going to put plus signs on those and minus signs on those. Oh, oh, of course. You see the main point of of course that e to the plus something e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta combined to give 2 cos theta. Right. So that's the key simplification that's going to make this much neater. So I have 2 cos theta minus 2. I have 2 cos theta minus 2. And if I bring out a minus sign, I'll have 2 minus 2 cos theta. And that's what I want to write. I want to write 2 minus 2 cos theta. I just want to see what that's. What that's, uh, I, I want to see what that expression is. Right? So that brought out a minus sign just to match that minus sign. And uh, the c squareds match. But what's different is this k squared has now gone into this 2 minus 2 cos k delta x. I'll write it divided by delta x squared. Do you see that this is, that's the change. k squared, which is a positive quantity, became this, which is also a positive quantity, 2 minus 2 cos theta, but it's not a pure k squared. We are getting dispersion. Different frequencies 
are showing up inside the cosine, and that's not a linear function. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing different frequencies going their own way in a more, uh, more interesting more way than just what we saw here with k squared. And of course, when we take the square root, as we did here, that produced linear in k and no dispersion and, and uh, sim something simple. But here, when we take the square root, okay, let's take, let's get ready to take the square root. How can we take the square root of that? By writing it as a square. It's never, it's, it's never negative. And if I use a little trigonometry, so I'm just going to write it down. This is four, I think it's sine squared of beta over two. That's just a handy fact. It's handy because I can take its square root and really see what, so theta, remember this theta is standing for k delta x. So then I should, I want to divide it by delta x squared. Can I bring down that quantity just so you see it again? So this was the 2 minus 2 cos theta with the minus sign and dividing by delta x squared. And that's, so it was g double prime. Well, let's just write it. So I have g double, I'm now going to copy what I, g double prime was the minus sign times the c squared times this 4 sine squared of k delta x on 2 divided by delta x squared. Well, maybe I'll put the delta x squared over there where it kind of belongs. Okay. Times g. Always forgetting g. Okay. So, we, we're just following the golden way here of plugging in an exponential and seeing what happens. And what happens is pretty nice. The solution we can, we now know what the solutions are. There'll be two solutions. It's a linear problem, so the solutions will be exponential in t. So the solution, the, the, the solutions will have a plus or minus i because it's a minus sign. So g, can I write it this way? g of the solution of this, or the two, the two exponential solutions will be e, to the plus or minus, and I'm going to take the square root, i times c times the square root of this. Well, actually, not that's not so hard. Two, that was our point, wasn't it? Sorry, I forgot about that. Sine k delta x over 2 divided by delta x. And look, here, here's something nice. Bring the 2 down there. Put it, make it one half in the denominator. Do you see what what this expression is? Actually, do you know its name? Do you know? It's the sink function. It's the sink function, right. And for very small delta x, oh, times t. Right? It, it's just, we just have an exponential. Of course we do. This was a constant coefficient problem in t. So, and of second order, so I had two exponentials. And I just took the square root of that coefficient, put it there, times t. Uh, absolutely straightforward. And now, so everything is, this, this quantity is the, is the key one. And this is the quantity which, for small k, or small delta x is approximately what? So, so if, if, if k and delta x are small, or if even just delta x is small, what does this sink function look like? What, what is that ratio approximately when k is small? Well, what does the sine of theta look like 
when theta is a small angle. Looks like theta, right? Sine theta is about theta. So this thing is about k delta x over 2 divided by delta. It's k. So it's approximately k for a small delta x, let's say. Delta x is small, that's a, right? That's a, the, the key thing to know about the sink function. That it, it begins by approximating the sine function, but then, of course, when k delta x gets large, it wanders away. It's not linear in k. See, it starts out practically linear in k, and that k is exactly the right k. That's the right factor. That's the k here. But in the differential equation, it stayed k, and in the difference equation, as k for k delta x moving moving away, it it changes, and uh, that's why. Well, of course, that's the source of the error. And we're seeing now why the method is probably second order accuracy. Yeah, we we know that these second. Differences are second, give second order accuracy. This would be, if I looked at the next term, what's the next term in sine theta? Sine theta starts out theta, and then what's the, what's the term after that? Everybody's Taylor series are humming. Theta cubed. It's a theta cubed term. Ex exactly, it's a minus theta cube over 6. Three factorial, but it's a theta cube term, and and uh, so the theta gave us the right thing, and then two more powers of theta will give us a second order error. Right. Okay. Okay. I better move, since so that's the story for semi discrete. Semi discrete produced a pure exponential, but with uh, with a phase factor, you could say, that that wasn't linear in K where the real one was. Okay. Now, what about, let me move up to that board above, where now we're going to have, we have it, it's discrete in time as well, so we're going to have single steps well, what's going to be the difference? Again, I'm going to try. You know, I only have one idea here. Ujn will be some g, some growth factor, times e to the i j k delta x. The same. I'm, I'm going to try an e to the i k x. And in the space variable, it will be g. And, oh, and after n steps, it'll be g n time. So this is the discrete. This is right. This is the uh, ansatz, to use a fancy word. This is what you plug in. A little crazy to use the word ansatz, which sounds fancy, and the word plug, which is far from fancy. I should say, substitute. Okay. So substitute it in. All right. Do we know what the process is going to do? When I plug it in, sorry, substitute it in, on the left we get, and I'm going to cancel, I'm going to cancel this from every term. So all I'm interested in is the, well, maybe I'll cancel g to the n minus 1. So let me write down what I get. This is going to give me, in the time direction, I'll have a g squared minus a 2g plus a 1 over delta t squared. And in the space direction, which is at the centered time, so it's going to multiply a g, it's going to be my same, my very same thing. I could maybe give it a name here. I, I, I don't know whether. Should I give it a name? Or well, I know what it is anyway, because it's the same thing that I had in the, in the semi-discrete method. It's this, uh, uh, yeah, let, let's see what it looks like. At, at this point, 
it was, uh, yeah, there, so there's a C, oh, well, look, look let, let's do one thing. Let's, let me get this delta T squared up there, times the C squared divided by the delta X squared. Let me just clean up those constants. So, so that, when I multiply up by the delta T squared, times the C squared divided by the delta X squared, what's that? C delta T over delta X squared is my old ratio, the Courant number, R squared. And then it's this times G. So this will all be just exactly the same. And that's what I simplified here. But, well, I'll, let me just leave it as uh, with a minus. Let me remember that I did take a minus so that I could write it as 2 minus 2 cosine of K delta X times G. Is that... I really think I have kept track of everything here. The R squared coming from all this stuff, the minus 2 coming here, and the plus 2 cosine coming from there. You okay with that? But there's one new ingredient here. And again, g to the n minus, I canceled a g to the n minus 1 times this from every term. Okay, so the new ingredient that we just have five minutes to deal with is the fact that we have second, we have g squared has showed up. So why did g squared show up? Because it's a, a multi-step method. And therefore, I've got two g's, of course. I had two g's in all these other cases because I had second derivatives and now I have second difference. So I have two G, so I have to solve for G, and, and what is stability going to depend on? Stability is going to be whether G, both G's, because there are two of them now, are less or equal to one. That, that's what I have to check, and, and that's the equation. And what do we figure? We figure that if R is pretty big, if, if R is big, no way. If R is big, the current test will fail and stability will fail. But if R is small, then I expect I have a right to hope for stability. So it's going to be the size of R. Okay, so I just have to, I've got this quadratic equation. I'm going to bring this thing over here. I'm going to write this as G squared minus 2ag plus 1 equals 0, where a is this quantity, so at minus 2a, so a is a 1 from there, and when I bring this over to the other side, it's going to be a plus r squared, factoring out the, notice the 2 is everywhere, so I put the 2 here, the a is going to, the a comes from the 1 there, and from this, times the r squared, 1 plus r squared minus r squared cos k delta x. I'm just doing algebra. And it's coming out nicely. It's coming out to a nice equation here with a slightly messy expression for A, but if I, now that I've named this quantity A, I can solve this. So what's the solution? I remember the quadratic formula, and I get G as 1, I think, plus or minus the square root of 1 minus A squared. That's G. Oh, maybe this is an A. Probably is. If, I guess the quadratic equation takes a little memorizing, but I guess the first point is that that coefficient shows up there, and then the square root that we know. Okay. So what's up? Uh, 
again, none of this is deep. I'm just following my one one way path. Check stability. Check the size of G. Get an equation for G, get a formula for G, and look at it. Okay. So A is some positive number, and, and the key is going to be whether A is bigger than 1 or smaller than 1. If A is, is that right, 1 minus A squared? Or should that be A squared minus 1? Is it A squared minus 1? Yeah. Professors are not responsible for the quadratic formula because we proved that we could do it in third grade and uh, lost it out since. I guess it's that, right. Is that right? Yeah. Because, look, here, here's the story. Suppose A is bigger than 1. Suppose, I, I, I'm really looking at the roots of this equation. And, and notice, by the way, the roots of that equation multiply to give 1. So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm on the edge here. Either both roots have size 1 or one of those roots is too big. And the test is going to be, is A greater than 1? A greater than 1 will be unstable. And A less than 1 will be stable. And I'll, I'll connect A less than 1 to R less than 1. That will give me R less than 1. All right. Now, I've, I've given away the result because we, time is pressing. Let me just take the, take the time, remaining time to see this. Suppose A is bigger than 1. I'm just looking at the roots of this equation, and here they are. If A is bigger than 1, like 2, I have 2 plus square root of 3, I'm way out. Right? I'm bigger than 1, no question. Suppose A is less than 1. Suppose A is a half. Then I have a half plus or minus the square root of what? What's up here? If A is smaller than 1, this is negative. And if it's negative, its square root is imaginary. So th this is good. I have a real part and then an imaginary part and then on some magic little bit of board I'm going to add their squares. So I just want to take the real part squared and the imaginary part squared. Now the imaginary part is going to be 1 minus a squared because when I bring out an i then I have a 1 minus a squared there and when I add them I get 1. So let me just say again what it is. I just figured out what is absolute value of g squared as real part squared and imaginary part squared, and I got the answer 1. So the conclusion is the roots are stable when a is below 1, and I have instability when a is above 1. And then if I track that down, that reduces to the tests. It just happens to be the same test on R, whether R is below 1, which is the current friedrich levy condition, that I'm staying inside the characteristic, or R is bigger than 1 and I'm taking a delta T that isn't, isn't stable. Okay, so that, I'm sorry to go slightly over the time. Thanks for staying with me. I'll begin next time with this staggered grid. That won't take the whole lecture, but it's worth knowing because we see staggered grids in many of the best methods. Okay, thanks. Have a good weekend, and I guess it's Tuesday rather than Monday that I see you next. Okay.
entered it with the like the, the original.